Today on Between the Lines, scientist and philosopher Gerald Schroeder. I'm Barry Kibrick. Gerald has worked in both physics and biology. But in recent years, he's emerged as one of the most popular and accessible apostles for the melding of science and religion. With his book, The Science of God, he looked at science and faith as different perspectives on a single whole. Now with his latest book, The Hidden Face of God, he takes a bold step to show that science properly understood provides positive reasons for faith. I'm a writer today because I was a reader when I was 11 years old. And it was... You do, need, need, you do not need to prove your state of happiness to anybody. Most of these speeches were as much as a month in preparation. Characters, the heroes in this book are seekers of truth in, in a story that, that involves a lot of corruption. You don't get a chance to really talk about what's real. And that is the first thing to do. Gerald, welcome to the show. This, I want to let my viewers know, is a first ever for Between the Lines. Uh, my viewers know that I, I really read every book that's on the show, and I read them in detail. I didn't even ask you to come on the show until yesterday afternoon. What happened was I was driving to work. I heard you on the Dennis Prager show, who I had on my show twice, and I had his producer, Alan Estrin, on my show. I quickly called Alan after I heard your conversation. I said, this is going to be strange, but I've got to meet Gerald Schroeder. And I, once we set that in place, which was yesterday, I did go about reading everything I can on the three books that you did write, The Hidden Face of God, which is the most recent one, Genesis and the Big Bang, and The Science of God. And I'm going to show all three books because I'm going to be also pulling from your website about the conversation. And as I said, what attracted me most, and I'm gonna use this as a little bit of a tease, viewers, is the actual physics of life after death. But we're not gonna start there. I'm gonna start a little bit easier, and that is with your words, a single consciousness, a universal wisdom, pervades the universe. It's a beautiful thought. It's you true. wrote it. <laughs> it's a beautiful thought, and it's true. And it's demonstrably true. It's not demonstrably true in, in, in tapping into this wisdom because that's, that you either feel or you don't feel. But all of physics, with no exception, holds by the fact that there's, a, that there's a material oneness that it pervades the world. The material oneness being that everything is made from the energy of the Big Bang, the creation of the universe. After the creation of the universe, nothing physical was ever created. Everything is made from that. And Barry, what that means is the stuff that makes up you, your body, not your soul, but the body, the stuff that makes it me, the table, whatever, the chairs, the clothing, all enters the universe 15 billion years ago as energy, light beams. And those light beams evolved over time, developed over time, became matter, Einstein's famous equation, how energy can take on the form of matter equals mc squared, and the matter changed into elements of life in stars. And about four billion years ago on the Earth, the Earth forms, the solar system forms, water forms on the Earth, life starts immediately, and it's all built from the light beams of creation. So from, from a science point of view, we can demonstrate, and ev essentially every scientist holds by this, accepts this, that everything you see around you has been in the universe in a different form, but for 15 billion years, or 14 billion, depending what laboratory you listen to. 15 billion years ago, an explosion from absolute nothing brings the energy of existence into, the, into, into being, and that energy goes through that, that chain of events that I just mentioned, energy, matter, matter into the elements and the stars, stars into rocks and water, the Earth just in the right position, liquid water, Venus is too close, Mars is too far, and out of this comes life, and you and I and everything you see around you. So the problem that, now for this universal consciousness, the problem is how do light beings become alive? Because they did. Everyone, you can be the most avid atheist in the world, thinks that theology is completely wrong. Leave theology aside. No theology, just pure physics. Light beams, energy was created and it became alive. It took 15 billion years. It doesn't matter if it took 15 billion years or 15 seconds or 15 gazillion years. The, main th the amount of time isn't a miracle. The miracle is that light beams became alive and everyone accepts it. So how do light beams become conscious? It's a big problem. It's a great stretch, except for the fact 
that within, with, embedded in this, embedded in this understanding of the universe, is a consciousness that predates the existence, and physics holds by that today. Physics accepts the, you talk to quantum physicists, and they're, they're poetic. The essence of existence is information. Well, I want to, re as a physicist having you here, and, and as I said, we're gonna explore with my theories and all of this as we go through it, and I want to explore that, that wisdom, that information, because you yourself even question, where does the information arise? That's how you get, I guess, to the point of something transcendent, something, do you see that then? Transcendent would imply outside of the universe. Outside of the physical. It's manifest in the universe, in the, it, it enters the universe as a metaphysical reality. Metaphysical, I don't mean philosophical, I mean not physical. When we think, we think in terms totally the physical, right? Time, space, and matter. That's how our, the box that we're locked into. But there are other inputs as well. And the question that I have to ask is, there's no hint, and I'm, uh, that's what I'm leading to, to trying to, to delve into what you just suggested. There's no hint in protons, in neutrons, the things that make up an atom. There's no hint of consciousness, of, of awareness in them. Where do you see a pro and yet consciousness arrives in them because our body and our brains are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Right, you know, this stuff, this stuff of the physical world. So where's the hint of consciousness? It's not, if you just take them as, as material objects, then there's no hint of this, and yet we know that we feel self-aware. You know you're Barry, and I know I'm Jerry. And I always know I'm, in, in, and there's that. Something allows this totally, in quotes, non-living matter to become living, and not just living, but self-aware, to feel joy, wonder, boredom, excitement. Where? There's no hint of that in any, in any, of, the, in any of the phenomena that, that make up the physical world. And that's because our, and I, as I understand it, and, and physic, it's not just me, spirit, and persons who have, have won, you know, the Nobel laureates in, in, this, in this whole field of quantum mechanics talk about this idea that there's something more fundamental in the universe, something so basic that you can't even describe it as physical. That the mechanical reality that we see around us, this mechanical physical world, is a manifestation because our bodies are in the world, but there's something beyond that that's outside of our bodies. Well, I heard you, as I said, on, on the Dennis Prager show, and, and one of the things that caught my mind was this analogy you used about a radio. And you said a radio is sitting there, and, and it is picking up music from, uh, and we, by the way, you, you made it interestingly clear that we know somewhat the science of how the waves may travel, but the consciousness is different because, as you said, we may, and I, this goes back to that old saying, if a tree falls in the forest mm -hmm. and no one is there, does it make a sound? The answer, I'm going to have to take a leap here, according to you, would be no, because it'll make a sound wave, but no mm -hmm. one would hear it, nothing would hear it. The sound is not in your brain, it's only this translation of chemicals that come around from the wave, yet we can make these deductions. So you're, in that way, the universe exists because we think it exists. What you just said is beautiful. I'm not, I'm not just saying it because we're, it's beautiful. The fact is, the sound waves exist, but, there's no, but the universe is silent. There's no sound in the universe. The sound is all in here. That is our, exactly. The sound waves exist, but the machine that picks them up, I'm just being very material in this statement, the brain that picks them up, do we know exactly how the waves make the eardrum move and the bones move and the other end eardrum and the hairs in our auditory canal? That's all chemistry, but that's not sound. The sound is totally how we perceive it. We know how all the information comes in. That's why I, think, I just really, sometimes I get goose pebbles when I think about these, well, what you just said. The tree falls, there's no sound, you're exactly right. The sound waves are there. But until you hear it, until the, until the system that picks up those sound waves through the ears, whether it's an animal or whether it's a human, then, this, then it becomes sound. In your brain, the way I would say it, in your brain there's no sound. I hear you talking, you hear me talking, but there's no sound in your brain. There's chemistry in your brain. So the simplistic answer is, well, we interpret that chemistry as sound. Obviously we do, that's why we think we're hearing sound. But where's the interpretation? It's the replay that becomes a problem. The information coming in, we know. But where's the replay? Any, neurology will t will t any neurologist will tell you, put a microstethoscope anywhere in the brain, 
You don't hear any sound. You might hear gurgle, gurgle as the blood goes through the veins, but there's no sound, no A, B, C, D, E, nothing. So where's the sound? I, I think that we get the sound in the mind and not in the brain. And that the mind, it's a debate that's been going on, but we now, there's so much neurology that's known, and there's no explanation for many phenomena, like the universe being silent, but we don't hear it as silent, we hear it as sound. We've been very careful, and you've been careful, to avoid what you call the G word. Yeah. Because once you say the G word, the God word, and it's funny, you use this example, you could say that you know a, a, a billion dollars could be spent on a going to a movie where they say the force, and that's okay. Star yeah. Wars can say the force, but yeah. we can't say the yeah. G word. It takes it out of science once we do. Yet many scientists have played with this G word. How does this all now fit in when you take this notion of something that's intelligent, we call it mind, we have mind, as you said, every living thing has mind. How do we reconcile what the metaphysical mind is? Is that the G word? You could, it's, because it's, pers that it's, it's our part as well, it could, be the, it could be the G word interacting on the world, but it's not the G word. It's not God, I'll, I'll, I'll say it out loud. It's, it's uh, that the origin of this wisdom, the origin of this, con this super consciousness, I would say, would be what we would conventionally call God. Not necessarily the God of the Bible. I'm willing to go with it being the God of the Bible, as I do. I mean, that, that, but, but it may not be the God of the Bible. It, it still would be a metaphysical force that created the universe and is active in the universe, but that's the key aspect, that it's active still. The fact is, when you get non-living matter becoming alive, that's one thing, and then becoming alive in consciousness, how? It is as if there is some other force imprinted into the world, and, this, and that would be, the source of that force would be the G word the source of what's making the world go together. You mentioned Einstein before, and, and everyone knows E equals MC squared, but I'd really love to explore that for a moment because what that really says is that the energy, E, is equal to this mass of all the mass. So in other words, like you said earlier, all the energy that has ever been here is here, all the mass that is here is here. Is made from that energy. Made from that energy. Yeah. But where he comes in when he says it's C squared, it's really, not an actual number, in fact. I mean, there is a speed of light and it's squared, but the purpose of it is to really show you how much energy is required to make the smallest piece of matter, and literally, that's why we have nuclear power. Because if you, as, as you said, I think in one of the, the lectures or, or books I read was, you just crack open the, the energy of a petal of a flower, and it would be the same as the energy of uranium. It takes that much energy to make the smallest piece of matter. I've seen six atomic bombs detonated in my work, within, literally present as one of the scientists active in the, it hadn't been disarmament, but active in this work. A few grams, the first nuclear test I saw, the first one was in Nevada. It was an underground test. They all vented, but there was an underground test. Two or three grams of uranium Changed, turned the Rainier Mesa, an entire mountain, into a bowl of jello or jelly, however you say, you know, rocking like this. A couple of grams. The amount of energy, that's why C, the letter C is a huge number, and C squared is squared fast, which is accurate. You say there's this vast amount of energy present that is released. But, but it's important, I think, in that C equals MC squared equation to realize that that equation doesn't say the energy disappears and becomes matter. That's not what it says. It says the energy changes form, remains energy, but takes on form. If we look at E equals mc squared, and we see that all this energy is still in existence, but when we see all of this existence, therefore, when one dies, there is still energy that exists. Something is still going on. Now, I'm not talking about psychic phenomena where you can necessarily tap into that energy, mm -hmm. but that energy is still going on, and you are now entering into that realm. That's what I want to begin exploring with you. There is this consciousness that exists forever, and at some level, you, that personal consciousness 
remains and remains personal to you. That is to say, the you that you are, the you that feels yourself as you. Information is stored in the brain. We know that from, God forbid, brain damage or other things. We know the brain storms a lot of, of, of information. But the replay, the sensation of you being you, is not necessarily in the brain. If you destroy part of the brain and you can't pick that up any longer, it's just like the radio being scratched in one place and you can only pick up certain of the, of the bandwidth but not the total bandwidth. The same being on the brain. When the brain becomes damaged or unfortunately eventually dies, that hasn't stopped the mind from existing because the mind is not shackled to the brain. But the only way our body can pick up this information is through the brain. I'll put it this way. If consciousness, self-awareness is hidden in the brain, in the physical brain, it's very well hidden because there's no evidence in the brain of it. The information is stored there, but the sensation, the feeling that Barry is Barry, that Jerry is Jerry, that's the mind. Then let me explain. And the mind continues after that, after the death. Then after, now this is where we're going to get tricky, okay? Philosophically, we're still on, on track here, but now you actually are taking it even further than I thought you would, so I'm going to get to play a little bit more. If that mind is not destroyed, we know it's not, it's energy just like it, just we said, we know it is not, I mean, the brain may be destroyed, but the sensations are out there. Maybe the radio, your body is not there to pick it up. Will one day, could someone tap back into it? Uh, I'm bound by... See, I, you know, a year and a half ago, I was invited to the United States to give a lecture on this to, I don't know if you can say on television, Homeland Security, I just put it there, I won't say where. Yeah. You realize what that means, if you can tap into that? You know what it means for security, let alone just a personal gain? Yes. I don't know how. I don't have the ability to know how necessarily. I have some ideas. But the answer is yes. That's out there. Because the mind, again, I give an example. I live in Israel. Sorry, I know I have to pause okay. for a second. Yeah. I mean, this is about as heavy duty as you can get. I, I'm, I was comfortable. I'll tell you what I was comfortable. I was comfortable knowing that the energy existed. I don't know why, that, may, that didn't seem to be even that big of a leap of faith for me. It seemed that, I, can't, I was surprised that people didn't agree with that. That is the physics. The tapping in part, you're going now someplace very different. If, if, if the brain, now this energy of which is the mind is not necessarily the energy that was created at the Big Bang. That energy made stuff. This energy, we're talking about something, a metaphysical concept of energy, this mind. If the brain can tap into it, and the brain does tap into it, because we're both self-aware, thank God, at the moment. That means that some level of a chemical, physical, probably fantastically complex system is able to tap into this mind because you're tapping in, you're, you're, you're experiencing it right now. And it's, uh, it's not new age. I want to get very clear, this is not new age, it's new physics. But, the, but there, are so, there are the most ancient commentaries, in, in, maybe in other religions, I know biblical religion, okay? The most ancient of commentaries talk about this. Not esoterically, they bring it down to the specific wording of the text. I'm sure it's beyond whether you'd like to get in at, at, at the moment, but it does. In the Science of God, I have one paragraph on this. I, I know the page, page 177. Why? Because I didn't know I had it in my books, and one of my students said, wait, you know, you talk about this in the Science of God page. And there it was. The fact is, there's, a, there's subtly in the, wor in the wording of the text, that tells us that there is this wisdom, mind, however you want to say it, that pervades all existence. We have a small part of it. That's what's instilled, like a spark. You know, you have a flame and your sparks go out. Physically, we're a small part of the big creation. And mentally, we are part of, that of a mind. If you can make a brain that can tune into it, and the brain we know is chemistry. If you can make that chemistry, you can tap into it. Simple? Obviously not. But it wasn't simple to invest in, invent a transistor or for the, the website to be produced, and, and the web, the international. But it can be done. And once it can be done, you say it's heavy. It's, it's about as heavy as you can get. Oh, Gerald. Uh, uh, 
I want I need to take a break for a second. I want to put I want to put up your website. You I don't know if you will even respond. Do you? I didn't even get a chance to ask. Will you respond if people contact you through they, there? They make it short emails and no attachments. I Perfect. do not open attachments. Okay, great. Let me give out your website. There's got to be a lot of people interested in this, and it's also, by the way, where they can uh, find out more about the hidden face of God, your new book, uh, Genesis and the Big Bang, and the Science of God as well. It's www. GeraldSchroeder.com. That's G E R A L D S C H R O E D R D E R D E R. That's right. G E Gerald Schroeder.com, as yeah. as the name of the author is. And let me take a pause back because I'm going to let that hang there because I don't. If we go any further, this may I may start getting psychics calling me up, and I don't want to deal with that. Let me talk though about something that is in the hidden face of God, and this is the fine-tuning of the universe, a chapter that you call, and, and this also has implications, not quite as heavy as that last one, but it, it shows again some sort of intervention yeah. taking place. Yeah. The universe is made for life. That's given. The question is, can you get it by random chance? What it's saying is that our universe, our universe is designed for life. If there are not an, a near infinite number of the universes, then, in other words, if there's only one universe, and all the evidence is that there's one universe, the one we live in, it's designed. Everything about the universe, the idea that there are only three spatial dimensions, length, length width, and height. But, but let's just look at, the, let's look at the solar system, okay? Because, and if we're getting to life. So what do you need for life as we know it? Well, we need, as, as we understand life, you need carbon, first of all. The Big Bang produced carbon only indirectly through the stars. The Big Bang creation was first energy, and then the first two elements, hydrogen and helium, very little of anything else. And then in the stars, the other elements are made by squeezing the hydrogen and helium together like Lego blocks, truly like Lego blocks, building these heavier elements. Carbon, it just turns out, which is what the only element in the universe, no matter how you think of any form of life you may think of, carbon is the essence. It has to be, because carbon is the only element of the 92 elements that we have that can form these complex chains. The next element that can do it is silicon. That's why transistors are made for it, but it's so big it doesn't bond properly for life. It bonds perfectly for transistors, but not for life. Carbon is the most abundant element in the universe that is solid when water is liquid, and that's exactly what you need for life. An element that would be solid at the temperature range where water would be liquid. In the nine planets that go around the Earth, only one, uh, only one planet is in a location where water will be liquid on the surface of that planet, and that's the Earth. Yet there should be no Earth where the Earth is located. In the distribution of matter, this may be complex, but I just want to just, very, just to point out some, some of the amazingness about the, uh, the universe being tuned for life. In the distribution of matter in a rotating system, the separation of, of groupings is excuse me, exponential, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 30, and it doubles each time. All of the planets double in distance. If you take Mercury as one unit of distance away from the Sun, that's 55 million kilometers, if you call that 1, then Venus is 2. Mars is 4. The asteroids are 8. Jupiter is 16, 32, 64. But you notice they didn't mention Earth there because it goes one, two, three for Earth, four for Mars. The asteroids wanted to be a planet, but Jupiter tore them apart. Jupiter, Uranian, next. There should be no Earth where the Earth is. But the only habitable zone, the only zone in this magnificent region of the universe we call the solar system, the only zone where life can exist is where the Earth is. There shouldn't be an Earth where the Earth is. Does that prove there's a God, the big G word? Not in my book. But it does open the door for that possibility. I think, you know, I mean, there's, there, but that's, this, that's just a very tiny aspect. The Earth is just the right size to hold oxygen and nitrogen, but not so strong that it holds hydrogen. Hydrogen would be a light gas that expect, it's the lightest of gas, it escape, escapes to space. If the Earth held hydrogen also, there'd be no life on the Earth. Hydrogen escapes, but gosh, just look, Barry. Oxygen, it's right there to breathe, to give energy. I mean, the, the subtleties are overwhelming. The right amount of water, I mean, the list is very long, but it's, it makes one wonder, is the metaphysical active in the world? And those are the things that, that drove Anthony flew from being just a, a, wine, a deist, God winds up the universe and lets it run, 
to then stepping forward and saying, well, there has to be at least this far into, into creation, God present, getting the earth in the right place. And then what about rocks and water becoming alive? Random reactions, pretty unlikely. And then, you know, in other words, you can draw this G word further and further down into existence. And uh, what can I tell you? <laughs> it's, 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 it's heavy. <laughs> wow. Gerald, uh, I'm going to end with life. That's what you said. And uh, these are your words. The essence of life, of all life, is the storage, organization, and processing of information. And it's the expression of wisdom that lies at the heart of life. Thank you, Professor Gerald Schroeder, for sharing that information with us. Thank you for having me. My pleasure, and thank you for joining us. Now, before Gerald Schroeder leaves, I would like to leave you with these words. They're from his website, GeraldSchroeder.com. Wisdom is the fundamental building block of the universe, and as such, it is an inherent characteristic. In the processes of life, that wisdom finds its most complex revelation. Wisdom, information, an idea. It's the link between the metaphysical, creating force, and the physical creation. It is the hidden face of God. I'm Barry Kibrick. Wisdom is the fundamental building block of the universe. Whether you look through the heavens or through a microscope, as long as you look between the lines, you'll see the hidden face of God. Thank you, Gerald. Closed captioning is made possible by Mavenlink, business without boundaries, leveling the playing field for service businesses with enterprise-grade growth management software, and the expertise to empower companies worldwide to work faster and smarter. Learn more at mavenlink.com. To connect with Barry, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Barry Kibrick. And to contact Barry directly, watch past episodes of Between the Lines, and read his blog, visit us at barrykibrick.com. Mm -hmm.